episode six of Strange Brow Radio. I'm your host, Tobe Johnson. Today's guest, taxidermist, world-renowned taxidermist, Ken Walker out of Canada. I'm going to have a conversation with him about all things taxidermy and Sasquatch. Yeah, Ken's got a little background here, more than a little background with the hairy subject. So we'll talk to Ken more about that. But I couldn't talk to Ken without the familiar subject of our sponsor, Feral by Aaron at Etsy.com. Now, there's a new algorithm in place at Etsy. So if you haven't gone on there recently, go on there for goodness sake. And would you rate, review, check out some of the stuff? I think it's a little heart symbol. You got to plug away at it. That helps our sponsor out in return. That helps us out as well. That's Feral by Aaron at Etsy.com. And oh my gosh, if you bought something even better. Okay, next up, Ken Walker. Good show. Great show. We'll be right back. Today we have three-time world champion Ken Walker. And if you haven't heard that name, uh, it's a good name to to have inside your little memory box because Ken, as I said, is a three-time world champion of taxidermy. I don't know what his waiting list would be to get a piece done. I would imagine a three-time world champion probably has quite a, a long waiting list, but Ken sat down with me like he had all the time in the world, and I was extremely humbled for him to do that because I wanted to pick his brain quite a bit about uh, some projects I had been working on and to talk about the anatomy of everything from, you know, the wolf to the deer to, uh, I think he's even taxidermied an elephant or two. And, of course, Sasquatch. So we, we talk about his documentary, Big Fur, because he actually made a beautiful rendition of a Sasquatch. And um, so Ken and I go down that road and, and into some other areas as well. So without further ado, I give to you three-time world champion Ken Walker. Today we have taxidermist Ken Walker out of Alberta, Canada. He's also the owner of Walker's Wilderness Studio. He studied at the International School of Hard Knocks, as it says on his Facebook page, went to Victoria Composite High School in Edmonton, Alberta, and there's a bio here at the end of uh, my little statement. I'll read this too. Um, Taxidermist Ken Walker has joined the Danish Taxidermy Company, first class trophy as director of quality and creativity his reputation of the three-time world champion taxidermist and sculptor, Ken Walker, is known as a worldwide infamous and famous taxidermist. For decades, he has shared his talents and dedicated his life to taxidermy with countless colleagues and museums all over the world, including the Smithsonian. Is that right, Ken? Yeah, I was on the staff there. Yeah, I want to get into that one, too. Uh, Ken Walker is... Uh, also a Sasquatch witness, enthusiast, sculptor, uh, taxidermist as well. And I, I even found some clips of in Nat Geo. So you, you've been uh, everywhere and in everything and you're just kind of hiding out there. But you, uh, you and I first, uh, I want to thank you for coming on board and uh, spending some time with us here at Strange Brow. Um, it's an honor to have you and I appreciate you doing that. Oh, no, it's an honor to be here. I, I, you know, when it comes to the Sasquatch research and stuff like that, it's, it's not something I do for a living, you know. I, you hear all these people saying that people go out there and try to, you know, get money for doing Sasquatch. I couldn't even imagine making money doing it. I, I don't know how you would. But it, obviously, it's something that I'm kind of passionate about just, just because of uh, my investigations from the past some years through the hunting community which is a little bit unique well absolutely and you're right about the uh not being able to make money at this uh many have tried several have failed so it has to be 
one of those things that you do out of a passion and um, it's always nice to find another person who's passionate about it. Um, there's so much more I want to talk to you besides your encounter and uh, your documentary, Big Fur. We'll get into all that. But as far as Ken Walker, the, the man, uh, I looked a little bit on uh, some of your profile on Facebook and you and I've talked a little bit about this. You've been inside the taxidermy game for a long time, but uh, do you come from a long uh, lineage of taxidermists or how did you get you know, wrapped up in all this? Taxidermy is kind of a strange job. It, it's not a job that you find. It's kind of a job that finds you. Like taxidermists come from out of, out of nowhere. Uh, I was an anomaly in the family. I mean, I remember being a kid and hearing a conversation at the kitchen table about how do they do that, you know? And I wanted to answer the questions, but I was a kid, you know, and I had the little book from the library that says, this is how you do it. You sharpen the wires, you know, you wrap the, the Excelsior around the wires. And, but no, it was just something that I was always fascinated with animals, animal behavior. Uh, I was always artistic. Uh, I sculpt, you know, I, I sculpt with my left hand, but I'm right-handed, you know, just things like that. I've always had a, you know, more of an artistic flair really uh, than anything. And uh, so I just fell into it. it. It's like I said, it's something that more or less found me rather than I found it. So you started out real early as far as a career or when did you find out that you were good enough to actually start making money at it? Well, I, I actually uh, started out as a hobbyist like when I was 11 years old. Um, and I was making animated films at that time. It was stop motion animation, oh. one frame yeah. at a time. You know, just kind of cool. I, I always did cool stuff. And uh, I got this book from the library by Leon Prey, and I learned how to take a roadkill bird apart and put it back together. And when I was in high school, I hated my school. I hated every bit of it. It was a rough school. I didn't like it. But they put me in the work experience program when I was 16 years old for a dollar an hour, and they placed me in a taxidermy shop. You know, but I had to promise them I wouldn't quit my, wouldn't quit school to become a taxidermist. And at the end of it all, I quit school and became a taxidermist. I always wanted to find that counselor and go back and have a talk with him and say, look, I, I knew what I was doing. You, you didn't think I knew what I was doing, but I knew what I was doing, you know? And that was 40 years ago. I started professional. 40 years. Okay. 40 years, yeah. Wow. And so, you know, you have a staff of, uh, you know, mainly you and your family or how many people do you have working under you at this point? Uh, to be honest, it's pretty much me and my daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, she's got her own sub business and, and we kind of work together. Uh, I mean, I worked in production studios over the years. And when I, when I opened my own studio just to work on my own and do specialized work, it, w it would be fair to say that I'm more or less semi-retired because, you know, all of a sudden now I'm just picking my jobs. I'm doing a lot less work for a lot more money. Um, you know, and I'm doing something that I enjoy, you know, working on product and other things. I just, I worked really, really hard for all the years that I could. And now I'm, I'm just trying to work smarter and not harder. Right. And so you, uh, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, you traveled over to Norway, that you have some, uh, relationships all over the world. So when people will call you up regarding, having a piece done, you can't always have the animal on scene. So are you physically going over to other countries and doing pieces for them in their shop? Mostly when I go to other countries, other than Norway, because Norway was just me having fun as a young guy, uh, you know, and, and working as a taxidermist to pay, you know, to pay for all of my fun. But uh, as recently, like when I've, I went, I've been to China twice now, uh, I taught them how to do panda bears and more, more or less teaching and working with them, just showing them techniques. Uh, you know, that's what the traveling, the, the, the whole deal going to Europe with uh, the trophy specialists was them needing somebody to take their big business to the next level by, by training some of their staff. They're based, the shop is based out of Hungary and they have a lot of, uh, you know, taxidermists from the Ukraine, from uh, Serbia, you know, places like that. There's a lot of Hungarians that are living in these other countries from the old empire. And, you know, really good people. Uh, but from a business perspective, the overhead is a lot lower. But these people are really, really good. And, and when I went over there 
I, I really connected with them. So that's what I'm doing there now is I'm more or less uh, adding my, my name and, and my reputation to training them and, and also the perception for the clients that want a better quality job than what they were offering in the past. Wow. So most of my traveling is, is, uh, you know, sponsored they, you know, they want me to, you know, to teach them something or, or else I go to, you know, I was in Salzburg, Austria last year doing seminars, for example. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I take the opportunity to travel whenever I can. So what's out in the uh, garage right now, the workshop, what, what projects are you working on at present that, that you'd want people to know about? Uh, well, I got a couple of life-size walruses that have been here for a long time. They're going to Nigeria. Uh, right now I'm just working. I've got quite a few mountain lions that I have to get done. They're from last year. I'm behind, you know, I have my, my message on the phone says I'm not taking work in right now. I have too much. So lots of bears, you know, polar bears, grizzly bears, uh, black bears, um, lynx, wolverines. Uh, I, I specialize in life-size mammals pretty much, you know, and I have some, uh, you know, some exotic stuff, you know, like uh, I just did a Dagestan tur from Azerbaijan. Uh, you know, just, you know, bighorn sheep and all kinds of, well, you name it, if it's around here, I'm working on it. So walruses to Nigeria, is that a museum or that doesn't really fit as far as <laughs> what you would imagine? So how does that work? What's, what's going on in Nigeria? Well, it was, uh, I think their oil minister, he uh, actually hunted them up here. And they, they were in an, another taxidermist shop and those taxidermists tragically passed away in a plane crash. And so the work was, uh, had to be uh, farmed out to other taxidermists and, and uh, you know, the things that there is no forms for, that you have to make forms from scratch, things like, like these walruses. I, I knew they were going to end up at my place. So that's why they're here. You know, and a lot of people don't know the work that goes into making these forms here, but as someone who tried uh, this summer, in fact, to work with styrofoam and making forms, not only is it uh, labor intensive, intensive, but it's extremely messy. And, uh, you know, it takes years and years of experience, I would imagine, to do that. So I saw a little bit, I think, on uh, the, you know, on Google uh, regarding you working with styrofoam and in particular walrus things. So it looks like you're using at least two separate types of polystyrofoam or foam in order to combine these two so that since i'm kind of nerding out as a maker myself here just very small scale compared to you um you there's taxidermy foam is that correct and then there's polystyrofoam are those the two main ones that you work with well actually the the, the best thing that we that i can use is uh, is a product from dow chemical and it's a flotation billet it's actually like an eight foot billet uh, that, that goes underneath the floating dock. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a polyurethane foam. And, and the nice thing about it is it's like two feet wide. It's like 12 inches thick and eight feet long. But with the walruses, I actually went to a plant that does the big white blocks that they put under the roads, things like that, you know, where these blocks can be anywhere from, you know, eight feet by eight feet by 20 feet, you know. Um, and uh, so they, I actually went to the place and, you know, being a little bit of a scavenger, they have a lot of stuff that, that doesn't come out right and they have to throw it away. Um, and so I just filled my trailer up with it, you know, so I got the stuff for like nothing. So I, I'm on the, I'm on the Scotsman's phone plan when it comes to, <laughs> you know. Because it's, ex it's expensive. It's not yeah. cheap. If, if you look up a giant eight foot block of, you know, construction foam yeah. it it's extremely expensive i mean i think i was quoted uh, maybe over six hundred dollars for an eight foot block of foam yeah uh, yeah and the flotation billets are are, are pricey but they, i mean literally for what i use them for it's worth it um yeah but you know, no i mean i i i lucked into a deal where i could get some you know i, I mean i got like i got like three years worth of foam for, for nothing <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so you're using all sorts of tools when you're cutting and forming these too. You're using, uh, you know, rasp and you're using sanding tools. But I got to ask you, do you have one of those monster scale hot foam cutters that, you know, I only dreamed of having when I was working on one? 
Oh, you mean like those hot wires? Yeah, use? yeah. It can scare me to death, you know. I, <laughs> I mean, it just it, it would be just like me to walk into it, you know. Um, but no, I use a sawzall. Um, I get I get the old sawzall going, and that and the foam just flies. I mean, I make a mess. This stuff gets everywhere, you know. But the rasps are usually, and the ruffers are usually for finishing it out. Like, you know, I, I can rough the piece in with the sawzall. It goes pretty quick. And then, uh, then what I do is I, I go in with the rasp. And I have to take the skin and throw it over the whole thing and make sure that I'm on target. You know, and I've got photographs on my computer of, of live walruses and things like that. I have to make sure that I use reference because, you know, I don't, I don't want the thing to look like a, you know, a big chunk of bologna or something. <laughs> it's it's got to have anatomy, you know. That's so, right. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's that aspect of it too, but uh, but yeah, no, it's it's um, and 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 it. So many people are intimidated by it, and one of the things that I teach when I have people come out is, you know, you, you can do anything. Don't be intimidated. Try. Like I'd rather see you try and fail than be scared to even try. You know, it's it's actually easier than people think. Well, you know. Ken, you inspired me to make a, another Bigfoot this summer. If anybody doesn't know, I made a, a Bigfoot for Ron Moorhead and uh, entitled him Biggie after Ron's uh, nomenclature for his Sierra Sasquatch that he had there. And so we worked on that for 90 days. And that's a whole that's other awesome. story. But, um, you know, I was working full time, 40 hours a week, and also trying to finish this deadline of 90 days and this eight foot tall Bigfoot and you can imagine the panic in my eye the last 30 days and the, you know the the polystyrofoam I'm, I'm surprised you're not picking out little white beads out of your hair right now and beard because that stuff it just adheres to any anything and everything it wants to so we did ours out of uh, fiberglass but uh, when you're working on something as difficult as a walrus is, I mean, I'm sure the people at home would maybe picture a walrus as just kind of being like this giant slippery tube, but it has defined areas where muscle and ligaments and, I mean, you have to really know where the anatomy is here. Is this something that just came to you over time uh, or did you study anatomy too on the side? I mean, you'd have to. Uh, I, I guess... I think the best way to describe it is that, that of course, to study it and, and reference it when I need it. But I also tend to have a feel for it. Uh, so, you know, like with, with the walrus, you, you, it's not so much the anatomy. It's the fact that there is structure holding, uh, holding it up inside. You know, the, the skeleton is, is animated. And then, of course, it's, it's covered by blubber. So the whole thing is kind of lifted. You have, you have to give it the impression that is being lifted from within by the skeleton. You know, I, I know one of these guys that went out on the ice with the Inuit and they shot one of these things and he says it was like they let the air out of it. He says, what, they have to hit him in the head so they don't go off the ice flow. And he said, the thing just went like, it just went flat, just like you let the air out of it. You know, he said it was, uh, and, and it made all the sense in the world to me because I understand that the, uh, it broke down the support structure on the inside. You know, so, you know, it went from being this, magnificent creature that's all strong to just a big glorified waterbed you know so yeah there, there's that aspect that you have to think about and there's probably is there a lot of air involved too with the you know walrus for buoyancy is that part of the reason it would kind of go deflated uh i'm not too sure like with with a lot of those marine mammals they're they're actually designed to uh sink uh, unless mm -hmm. they, you know, unless they, uh, you know, take in a lot of air, because if they go off the water, the, the, they all sink, and then you can't retrieve them in the ocean. If they go off the ice flow, I should say, um, you know, but also it makes sense that they have to be able to have a certain amount of buoyancy, because they go down and they dig the clams out of the bottom of the ocean. That's why they have all those whiskers. They put that big uh, face full of whiskers into the mud, and they find the, the clams. They eat mollusks. And then, uh, then they got to be able to swim back up and gulp more air, you know, or exchange their air. So they're probably designed to sting, but when they 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 probably regulate the air uh, as they're going down and coming up. I'm, it's it's quite fascinating, you know, their, the way these animals live and the conditions they live in. Yeah, and I don't think I've ever seen a taxidermied one around these parts. It just uh, 
unless maybe you're in a Cabela's or a, a museum, you, you never well, would. They can't come, the, these are Atlantic walruses. The Pacific walruses, I believe, is threatened, and they live in Alaska. Uh, but these uh, Atlantic walruses, like the ones that I have, uh, they're very, very plentiful, but, but because America has what they call the Marine Mammals Protection Act, they cannot, uh, or any part of them, cannot be imported into the USA. So you, if you saw one, it would be what, what they call pre-ban, you know, like the one we, we restored in the Smithsonian. It was, you know, from before the, uh, the ban on, on them coming into the USA. But believe it or not, the Atlantic walrus has a, what they call a CITES-3 listing, which is the same as a coyote. So they're not rare, you know, it's just that the Marine Mammal mm -hmm. Protection Act covers all marine mammals. I'm hung up on this walrus issue because I just watched a ter terrible uh, horror movie called Tusk, which is- Oh, I've heard of it. Oh my gosh. So I'm kind of landlocked in the imagery of this ridiculous uh, movie that was kind of a spinoff of Human Centipede, which was an, another, another podcast altogether but don't well, I, don't watch tusk you can't unsee a guy that turns into a walrus <laughs> it turns yeah. out stuck <laughs> no, 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 no. no I, I can't watch shows like that because i can actually relate you know? <laughs> right well no because I, I can i can i'll actually sit back and say hmm i know how to do that you know, I didn't know. <laughs> right right yeah. yeah no yeah it's a it's a crazy flick Okay, well, speaking of animal people, um, you know, let's let's get right into the heart of, uh, you know, our favorite uh, topic here, since <clears throat> it's unavoidable. Um, okay. I can't remember the first time I heard of Ken Walker, but I think it was through uh, a mutual uh, acquaintance. I don't know if uh, you know Dave Rodriguez or not, but... Um, yeah, yeah. Dave, Dave had mentioned your name back in 2009. Uh, he was one of the first people that I kind of met in the community when we mm -hmm. found a set of tracks out here in Springfield, Oregon. And okay. um, he had mentioned your name and uh, the area you were working in. And um, then I heard about your documentary um, that was, you know, Big Fur is the documentary that we're speaking of right now. In fact, uh, there's a GoFundMe page too, and we'll we'll talk about that later because there's quite a bit on uh, the GoFundMe right now as far as getting the documentary out there. But um, okay. your your ability to you know mimic nature through polystyrofoam and your imagination and your appreciation for uh, you know your eye and as far as making another Sasquatch. I mean, you hit the nail on the head as far as so many people have said. And um, I, I certainly was impressed with that. Um, I got a long way to go before I can ever hit that mark. But um, it really speaks volumes to people that talk to witnesses. And, you know, they'll do a sketch of what they saw, you know, but they don't have the artistic eye generally to have their imagination come out on paper, let alone the way you did it. So how long, uh, well, let's talk about why, why would you do a sculpture of Bigfoot? People don't know your story. So let them know about your sighting and, uh, and what your experience is with this subject matter. Well, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I was fascinated because I, I remember the, the Bighorn Dam incident in Alberta here. Uh, it was in the newspapers, you know, I was just a little kid and I remember my, uh, my dad i was saying dad look there's a picture of a sasquatch in the paper and, and my dad says no no he says that's just the indians dressed up because they don't want them to build the dam you know <laughs> and but I, it just didn't seem like that to me and you know they had the old uh, on the front of the edmonton journal I, I remember that they had the old uh photograph or the drawing that was from uh um uh, uh william was it william rowe that saw the one in it's in a historical uh, account where this guy who was a famous zoologist actually witnessed a Sasquatch and then had his daughter draw one. And I remember it being on the front of the journal and, and uh, these guys that were uh, building the Bighorn Dam down there on the, the Saskatchewan River there by Nordegg, they, they actually didn't want to come back to work because the Sasquatch was a big one too. And I, I think that there was, 
uh, three or four or five or six witnesses that actually were able to corro cor corroborate that it's, it was 10 feet tall. Uh, it's apparently one of the, the few, um, uh, you know, the, the few witness incidents where they could corro corroborate the height by where his head was. But uh, it was funny because there was, um, you know, it, it made, made the newspapers and everything, but there was a lost incident. Uh, one of the guys came in uh, and he quit his job on the spot. He, he took the, uh, he took the uh, keys from his, his uh, bulldozer, threw them down and he quit. And no one ever really knew what happened there. Years later, one of my clients, he is a big CEO of a big chemical company. He said that was a, that was a guy that he knew. And he said that that Sasquatch tried to pull him out of the bulldozer and he had to keep backing up and swinging the blade from side to side. And, uh, and he was able to finally, you know, finally thwart the thing. And uh, he said he was trying to get him out of the bulldozer. And, uh, you know, so that, there's your last incident. Uh, and it was related to me. And I mean, the guy was, you know, as sober as a judge. I mean, you know, most of these people I talk to in the hunting community and, and in my, uh, you know, my travels, like through, through uh, clients and whatnot, you know, you hear people say that 90% of these uh, accounts have to be, you know, not true. In my experience, I would say 99.9% .9 of them that I get from the hunting community are true. Because uh, there's never any, there, there's, there's never any motive to lie. Never, you know, and uh, they almost never tell anybody. So you grew up with this in your blood then. These are the stories that you uh, you had heard not only yeah. from, from your family, or, uh, but from the neighborhood itself. Yes, and uh, one of the things too that, that happened to me about, oh man, a long time ago, uh, I was driving down the road hunting bears in the spring, and all of a sudden this bear come running out. And I yelled bear, you know, cause we were just young and we get all excited, we grab our rifles and jump out of the truck. But it, when the thing came up on the road and it was booking it and it was, not a bear it was a man because uh i know every animal in the woods and the only thing that runs like that is a man but it cleared the road in no time flat and then it ran up a hill without slowing down and it hit the bush at i don't know how fast it was going it hit the bush at full speed and i said who is this dude you know why is he so afraid of us he's like three four hundred yards up ahead and he's dressed all in black he's gonna get shot you know and uh I drove for miles. There was no side roads. There was no vehicles. There was no nothing. Um, and the guy with me said, uh, was that a Sasquatch? And I said, there's no such thing. Uh, it had to be a man, you know, that's the only thing it could have been. And, uh, that was, uh, I've since found out that they've been logging that area in the south of a place called Kidney Lake, uh, in the Swan Hills of Alberta. And they still see them in the exact same place. So I have a bunch of other accounts from that spot. There's a little population of them in there. So that's what I, that's had to be what I saw. It makes 10 times more sense that I saw a Sasquatch than a man. And how many years back was that, Ken? Maybe 30. Yeah. I mean, it's a long time. But it, but, but it, 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 it never sat right with me. I it did, it, you know, there was something about that incident that never sat right with me you know i just I, I mean i can i can see it in my mind and you know when i when i picture it in my mind i can see the memorial day footage uh that's what i saw you know like what you see in the memorial day footage that's pretty much what i saw now the memorial day footage for people don't know is the one that's running from left to right on memorial day down in the field correct and there's possibly a juvenile that climbs up on, on or off the shoulders at the end of the clip. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's the one. Uh, that's the one. Let, you and know, so, uh, part of what I want to do with this show too, along the way is assume that most people are caught up on this issue. I don't really want it to be a show for newbies. So I'm just going to ask you about the anatomy of what you saw when it crossed the road there you and i've heard so many times about them clearing spaces you know large distance and single steps uh but yet there's these stubby little legs that uh you know i had to kind of account for when i was making my sculpture there's um 
this uh, bent knee phenomenon where they're constantly bent. What's, what do you think is going on as far as how they're moving, this gliding motion to them, physically working with all these other animals here? Where, where's the muscle coming from to make this great distance possible? Well, I think that in, in the case of the one that I saw, it was running. Uh, so it was cycling, you know. It wasn't walking as per se. It was, I mean, it was in a full, fast run. So it was, it was, it was cycling. And uh, that, that has a different, uh, a different look to it than how they actually walk. Uh, one, of, one of my friends who's seen so many Sasquatches, he knows more about them than anybody I know. I remember we were having a conversation once and he said to me, he says, do you ever try to walk like they do? He says, I've tried, I can't. You know, I mean, he's seen that many of them. And, uh, but when I built the model, and this is one of the things that, that uh, I have to stress, is I didn't actually come up with any of that. What I did is I built what, exactly what was in the Patterson footage. Now, what I did is, is uh, and there's been numerous uh, templates made of the size. Uh, what I, in one of the still photos, you know, the still photos are really clear. The, the Sasquatch, she has her foot up. You can see her entire foot. So basically what I did is I took the measurement of that foot and I measured all the bone lengths like I would any other animal from a, a two-dimensional reference. So I, everybody knows that the, the track is just under 15 inches long. So I used that to, to extrapolate the measurements uh, of this animal because I didn't really trust anybody else's uh, template because I didn't, I didn't come up with it. They did. And, but I knew I could do it with the track, you know, on the, the bottom of the foot. My, my template was exactly the same as John Green's, exactly. It was from what I extrapolated from the length of the foot. Uh, but the thing that's really weird about the Sasquatch is that it has a short shin. Like the femur is actually a normal length, but the shin is short. And as a result of that, the foot is longer, the shin is shorter, so that when it does its step forward, and of course it has the compliant gait where it doesn't straighten its legs. And that's easy to explain because if you weigh a thousand pounds, you're going to break your leg if you straighten. So uh, what it what it does is when it draws that leg forward, the the uh, the shin is parallel to the ground. You know, whereas people have that that, that angle and they they walk with a heel strike, uh, and that to me was so apparent. You know, and then I saw all these videos where they said, "Oh, it's easy for a man in a costume to walk the same way." You know, I've got kind of a trained eye for this stuff, and I'm like, "No, no, that's not what they're doing." Um, but if you talk to anybody like uh, who knows anything about anatomy, they'll tell you that if you have a, a solid, stiff arch like a human has in their foot, that if you weigh over 800 pounds, you're going to break your foot if you try to run. So that would explain the mid tarsal break, you know. I mean, it, it's uh, it's kind of uh, uh, an evolutionary adaptation for uh, attaining that size, um, you know. And there's all kinds of people talking about uh, Gigantopithecus being Sasquatch. I don't believe it was, um, but what Gigantopithecus teaches us is that it is in the DNA of a hominid to become that size. Uh, and so that's, I think that's the most important thing we can learn from Gigantopithecus. So you, I'm stuck on the comment you made. You said when they're walking, they're throwing their shin up so it's a horizontal plane. So as they're, as they're ambulating and walking in the Patterson-Gimlin footage there, are you saying that the most that that shin does is go at a 90 degree? It doesn't come out and, and flex outwards? It goes parallel to the ground. It does right. come out watch it sets its foot down flat it doesn't heel strike it's almost like it places its foot and it lifts it almost like it placing it like we had a discussion online about the uh why there was a, a ridge in the back of the heel well it makes sense if, if the foot is pressed straight down and lifted straight up that you're not going to have a gliding you know it's like a running buck track you know when, when i'm tracking deer in the snow when they're running there's a slash but when they're stepping like a cougar steps straight up and down like that, and they have a very distinct hot track that burns right into the snow, mm -hmm. almost cookie cutter, you know? Right. So, so, and, and from what I can see in that film, that's how they walk. Let um, me, uh, I'm going to share this, uh, 
the video clips with you that I have up here, the pictures. I have some of your work so people can see what we're talking about. So let me click a button here and I'm going to bring up, uh, you should be able to see my computer screen now. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I had to go up on the best shot of you there. <laughs> yeah. I can give you an idea how funny Big Fur is. Apparently it's yeah. not my movie, but it's so if pe funny, for people that are listening to the podcast here, um, it's a great photo of Ken uh, messing around with the, the facial features of, of the uh, Bigfoot that he's making here with his finger straight up the nose. I get the, uh, you got to have a little levity when you're knee deep in all this yeah. stuff here. But um, let me see if I can find uh, some of this compliant gate stuff here. Um we're showing a picture here of now Ken working on, uh, do you have a name for your, your big girl? Are we calling her Patty or what'd you name her? Yeah, that's what, uh, that's what Dan calls her is Patty. That's okay. she's, she's basically a model of Patty. It's, it's right. And if you can't see, I mean, I wish people that are listening to the podcast could see what I'm looking at here. The shins are almost half the size of the thighs. So the ratio seems kind of crazy, especially, um, you know, if you're if you're looking at something standing straight up that looks like a man, um, you, you think it's this shin size and this leg size that give them this floating capability? So many people talk about them looking like they're on rollerblades or sliding on ice. Is is this why this happens? Well, if you if you watch um, some of the some of the Sasquatch videos that are out there that are authentic, um, the Sasquatch takes a longer step because the foot flexes twice. And this is something that people forget. So it almost almost always looks like they're pulling their legs forward. It's just that their their leg they take a longer step, so their their leg ends up farther back than a, on a human, for example. So it um, so that's why they have this gliding motion is because of that long smooth step, and then of course because of their weight. Uh, the Patterson footage. The first thing I noticed when I the first time I saw it slowed down and and actually. Uh, slowed down and stabilized was I could tell how heavy that creature was. And I've had discussions with people like Adrian Erickson and even my trapper friends. And they said the animal has to be far heavier than a bear because just because of the, uh, the extraordinary size of the limbs and, and uh, you know, a bear has a big gut and these things don't have the same kind of gut. They have the big chest. So they're probably for a comparable size bear, they're probably at least double the weight, you know. And even Bob Gimlin, I think he said that the his horse track didn't go in as deep as uh, as the the Sasquatch track. And that's, so, that's, that's as far as scale on weight, what do you think Patty weighed? Uh, they've done some formulas, and they said they didn't think they were right that that you know she was up uh, upwards of a thousand pounds. Uh, I think that's I think that's close. I think that that is more right than wrong. Uh, you know, I mean, I've I've seen 800 pound grizzlies. I've skinned them, um, and they don't have near the, the the volume in their limbs that the Sasquatch does. Um, and and as far as one of the big ones, uh, as as my trapper friend likes to call them, one of the big ones, he said that. They are, he said they, their weight has to be off the scale. Uh, and, and usually when they take these tracks, like, uh, you know, the biggest tracks we found are like uh, 19 inches long, like 18 and three quarters, 19 inches long. And they make a serious impression. But if you, if you take a fake track, for example, and, and you try to make an impression in the ground, you can't get enough weight on it. You got to stack almost a thousand pounds of weight just to get it to make a mark because of, of, of the weight displacement, which is what the foot has evolved to do. It's, it's evolved to displace the weight of something that is that big. So um, I, think that, I think that people uh, have nothing to compare it to. And I, so, so when you get people making estimates, it's almost like estimating height. Um, if you're not used to seeing something 10 feet tall, then it won't look 10 feet tall to you. You, know? you have to have the experience of, uh, of knowing what a big animal weighs, you know. Um, but if, if when I sit down with people, you know, that do this research, this subject, and we reason it out, they have to be he a lot heavier than people think. And it would explain why they glide when they when they walk, because they would have to, just to just to carry the momentum properly. 
Right. And then you have this uh, common thread of them almost like on a spring where their ability to lower and raise themselves uh, without, you know, using their hands or their upper body, it's all lower yeah. body. Um, there must be great amount of dexterity and muscle tissue. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you, you accounted yeah, I, for it nicely. I mean, I, exactly. And, and the, the animal is, uh, you know, the, the being is, 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 uh, we, we, I mean, we, we, we don't know anything about it, at least officially. And, uh, you know, they have a dexterity that I always get people arguing with me about the, um, the Jacobs photo, you know, the one where, where they got the two camera track pictures of it, and uh, the the young one. In oh, this is the um, and, uh, this is the infrared the shot the with the, uh, right. It's like an infrared shot of for people that don't know the Jacobs photo. Explain what that is. It's a night vision photo that was taken of uh, two photographs of what appears to be a juvenile Sasquatch, like quite a young one. And uh, it uh, bends down and it actually sniffs the ground, but it, it bends its body like a jackknife. It, it comes, it, you know, it, it just bends straight down and it's got its face right against the ground and then it's got its arms out front in, in the second photo. So all right. of these people that think that it is a, uh, a bear with mange, I actually, uh, um, I show them the second photo and I could tell you absolutely that, that there's absolutely no way you cannot take a bear's spine and hips and bend it at that angle. It's impossible. You'll here snap. we go. You I, br all the meat off. I brought you up a picture here so we can kind of take a closer look at it here. Yeah. But so if, uh, there's no controversy in your mind then, Ken, with this particular photo here. You see, you do not see a bear with mange at all possible. I can carve a bear out of styrofoam from memory. I've mounted, I've mounted so many of them, over a thousand of them in my illustrious career. And uh, I mean, I, I make tracings of them and uh, that's not a bear, it's not even remotely a bear. It looks more like uh, a cross between a man and a chimpanzee. But the, uh, uh, the way that it bends in the second photo, uh, there was a, uh, uh, I was reading the BFRO accounts and I'm trying to remember where it was from. I think it was from, uh, well, it was from British Columbia along the river down on the way to Kamloops along Highway 16. A woman stopped and she saw a big Sasquatch and she watched it. And she says that it would stop and it would bend, it would turn over a rock and it bent exactly like that one. She says it put its face right against the ground without uh, bending his legs. You know, it just, it just stayed straight and it bent like that. So that's, that to me is corroborating evidence. Okay, she doesn't know anything about the Jacobs photo. She just saw this thing walking down the, the riverbank and stopped. And, it, and she, it was unafraid of her. As a matter of fact, she said it was still there when she drove away. But it, she described the exact same dexterity that I see in that photo. And that's one of the things in my investigations I always look for is, is people who don't know each other to corroborate each other's uh, evidence. What would be the nature of, what would it be doing by sticking its face down like that? Because I've heard that too before. What what would the activity be? Smelling, uh, foraging, oh, any ideas? Yeah. yeah, very likely, very likely smelling, um, if I had to guess, you know, uh, because obviously if it, you know, it, it doesn't have to have its face that close to the ground. But, right, uh, right. I think that's what it is. You know, I mean, that, that makes sense. You know, I, I don't know for sure. Um, but it's kind of like when, 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 when you're doing these observations, you try to, you try to find the explanation that makes the most sense. Uh, I don't think that uh, if it wanted to taste something, I don't think it would have to do that. It would just have to reach down, pick it up and taste it, you know. But if it was, if it was smelling the ground, that would make sense. And apparently apes do the same thing. Uh, you know, there's simian behavior there as well that uh, is similar. Right. And um, gosh, it makes me think back of a, you know, I had a chance to talk to Meldrum over the phone uh, regarding uh, some of his experiences along the, the way. And he had mentioned the um, extreme, uh, extreme anal behavior of chimpanzees as far as mimicking humans. He, he brought up... Um, a quick story here about working in an enclosure 
with a group of chimpanzees for a prolonged period of time. And each time he left the enclosure, he had a, a golf rake with him and he would comb through the sand to get rid of his, his, uh, his footprints. He was studying uh, the chimpanzee's footprints and not his own. So he would get rid of his footprints and lock the enclosure and the chimps would watch him from afar. After a couple days of raking his own tracks away and coming out of the enclosure, the, uh, the chimps would um, walk around in the sand and they started to comb their footprints as they would walk through the enclosure there. In fact, he said they did it you know, so perfectly that they were moving you know, pieces of sand uh, individually in order to show off you know that uh, they not only caught on but uh, they were doing it a little bit better than him so this dexterity part of them you know was seen at that point too but you know this hyper intelligence um, this extreme I mean where do you stand with what Sasquatch is and this hyper intelligence uh, you know beyond what people are maybe comfortable talking about well, um, you know, they, they, there used to be some, some guys that did, uh, uh, they used to analyze uh, film on Facebook. And I, I found it really interesting because uh, they were talking about how quickly the, the Sasquatch processes information, like the, how, how their brain works. And you have to remember that a dolphin has a bigger brain than a human, and even a Neanderthal, you know, for that matter. Uh, but the thing is, you can have a brain that's bigger or in a co comparable size, but they will use it in a different way. And uh, the Sasquatch appears to process information <clears throat> uh, a lot faster than a human. And this makes sense to me because, um, you know, we have this, this thing about when we're out hunting, if you see a wolf, uh, when you first see a wolf, you're usually surprised to see one. And because of their size, you, you don't right away know what you're looking at and by the time you realize it's a wolf he's gone because he's processed the situation way faster than you and if a sasquatch thinks three times faster than a man that's why you can't get a picture of one because by the time you say wait a minute that's a bigfoot i think i'm gonna have to get a photograph he's gone he's already processed the whole situation he's way ahead of you you know and that's it uh, and that makes all the sense in the world to me. Now, the Sierra sounds are interesting because I use those with, on witnesses. Uh, and even myself, I've heard the voices out in the woods where I know there's no people in an in area where there's Sasquatches. You know, I hear people talking. I can't figure out what they're saying. But I'm thinking, why are they back there? There's nothing back there. There's no trails back there. That's not, you know, why is there people there? And how did they get in here? I, I took the only road. I drove for two hours. There's nobody in here, just me. Um, but I've had people like one guy from Alaska at the taxidermy show came up to me and he says, I heard the craziest thing. So I played him the, the samurai talk, you know, from the Sierra sounds. And he said, buddy, you're the only guy who's ever showed me what, what I heard. And I said, so that's what you heard. He goes a lot faster. He said, way faster. He said exactly what you're playing for me right now. He said, but he said, really fast and uh, so there's a piece of corroborating evidence that they process information faster you know because even with the the study of the sierra, sierra sounds there they're getting a lot more out of it by slowing it down uh, so that makes sense makes total sense to me um and if they you know if, if they use their brain uh in a different way you know i, I know I know some things about Sasquatches that people will really question me. They'll raise one eyebrow. Um, well, that's you know, what that's what we like to hear. Raise some eyebrows, Ken. Well, um, if, and if move you, in a little bit closer to your computer. I can hear you better when you're up like that. There you go. Okay. That's perfect. Um, I, there, there's some accounts that I'm working on um, that I really I'm, I'm still. I'm still involved with trying to, I'm trying to get evidence. I'm trying to get conclusive evidence that these things exist. That is my main focus. You know, I talk to a lot of people. I get a lot of accounts all the time, almost every week. Um, but I don't put pins in maps. Uh, I'm, I'm chasing down the guy who's going to come into my shop one day and says, I got to show you something, you know, I've had this forever and I don't know what to do with it. 
and he opens up a box and puts a skull on my table. I mean, I, I, sooner or later, it's got to happen. Um, so I chased down quite a few uh, anecdotes um, of people who have uh, shot Sasquatches. Now, everybody knows that I was one of the first people to talk to Justin down in uh, about the Sierra Kills incident. Um, and I decided to, you know, pursue that in the wrong way. It turned out disastrous. It just I did, was dis I actually, you know what? I did not know that. So you're involved with Justin Smahey and the Bigfoot kill in the Sierras. I'm the first one who ever talked to him about it. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know and, that. And I've talked to him since. I've got to know him. We were down in California. We were on Chuck Testa's podcast there on YouTube or whatever. But uh, I, I sat down and I talked to him. And I've, I've never had any doubt at all that, that he shot two Sasquatch, you know. Um, and it's not an uncommon story for me. I know other people who've shot them. But I'm keeping it all under wraps until I can come up with hard evidence. But one of the things that I noticed was almost every time you get into a situation like that, it has to do with young ones. Uh, you know, that's one of the only times that a Sasquatch will make mistakes is if there's a young one involved, all the way from the Patterson footage to the Jacobs photo. I, you know, um, the old ones don't seem to make mistakes, but the young ones do, and they draw the, you know, the adults into, into the scenario. So... I, there, you know, I know of, of an incident where somebody ran afoul of, uh, of a Sasquatch with a young one and the female came after him and, uh, but the male didn't, the male was there and so were all the other ones, but the only one to actually come after him was the female, the, the female, and that's the same as a bear or, you know, or a lot of that's animal behavior is you protect your own young, but you don't protect the others young. Mm -hmm. Like, whereas as humans, we would protect the others young, but the Sasquatch is not like that. From what I can gather, they will only protect their own young, not another one's young. And uh, I find that compelling. Um, you know, so, and, and the other thing too is, you know, everybody likes to think that Sasquatch holds a grudge. They, they don't. If you cut down their forest, they move. They don't come back and flatten your tires like the Navi on Avatar, you know. They don't do that. They they have a very rudimentary way of of dealing with natural situations. Uh, they don't. They're not like us. They don't uh, place the same amount of value on things that we do. And this is why they will, you know, take your entire picnic basket and gift you with a stone. Uh, it's a gesture. It's nothing of value. They don't hold the same value. And this is what I've, from, from my investigations, that I seem to have, have come to the conclusion of is that, uh, you know, they, they, they have uh, a self-preservation instinct that's off the charts, but they don't, uh, they don't hold the same value, you know, like, like you, you, uh, you know, you killed my young one, so I'm going to hunt you down no matter where you live they let it go just like you do in nature you let they let it go and they walk away um this is something that that i've seemed to uh come up with in my in my accounts um which i find really interesting you know it's a little bit sad i mean these you know i mean i know of people who've shot them by accident uh i know these people real well like some of them um and you know, the more I hear these stories, but one of the one of the, the main things that I hear from anybody who's had a, any kind of experience where they have been lucky enough to or unlucky enough to actually see a dead one is they're not an animal. Uh, they're they're a hominid. There are people, just not human people. And uh, I've told everybody if the Sasquatch was a big lumbering ape, I would have already stuffed one for the museum. But they're not. They're smarter than us. OK much smarter than us um, now when I say smarter than us I mean it in a different way uh, the only advantage we have over the Sasquatch is our ability to compile knowledge you know everybody says uh, you know well I'm a human being you know I, us humans can build an airplane and I say to the guy yeah but can you build an airplane <laughs> no well no and uh, I got a pen right here okay you've got ink you've got refined metal you've got 
plastic extruding. I mean, there's a thousand years of compiled knowledge in this pen. And that's a fact. Okay. Now we're, we're leaning on the backs of those who came before us. Now, when it comes to a Sasquatch and uh, also uh, can bench press a, a Tacoma, <laughs> you know, so one-on-one, -on -one, they, they, they're far, far superior to us. And that's why people can't find them is because they have, they, they've got our number from the minute we step into the trees. Like I talk to a lot of people says, yeah, well, how much time do you spend in the bush? I says, I spend a lot of time in the bush, but I'm not going to outsmart a Sasquatch. I'm just not going to do it. I remember driving down through the Alberta habituation and I ran into Todd standing and he says, you know, they can hear that quad. And I says, yeah, and they can hear you walking. And, you know, you're not going to outsmart them. You're just not going to do it. Uh, the trapper told me that they habituated after six years. He said suddenly they would step out of the woods in front of them. He says it took six years of that, him being on that trap line wondering what all these weird occurrences are so the only way you're going to really study these things is if you is if you habituate with them and according to the the trapper it takes six years yeah you know it, i've heard two to three years for people to have them take food um it seems like it, it's at least a couple of years for them to come in close um especially during the daytime so, but six years. So this, this trapper would actually have daytime sightings with individuals? He said one time he was coming down the trail and a big female stepped out and she had a young one. And uh, he said the young one was quite young and it walked on all fours. He says then another mature female stepped out and she had uh, like a preteen adolescent sized mm -hmm. young one. And it walked on two legs. So we had two mature females with two different age youngsters and uh, the youngest one, the smallest one walked on all fours. And um, that was one of the things I asked Justin when, about his account was, you know, these young ones that he saw, did they walk on all fours or did they walk on two legs? And he told me half and half. When he told me that, I pretty much knew he was telling me the truth, um, you know? So yeah, this guy has seen, he's seen a lot of them. And he passed a couple polygraphs too, didn't he? Who, uh, uh, Justin? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know too much about that. Yeah, I think um, he did. You know, usually, uh, usually when it comes to, to somebody uh, who's lying, it's usually pretty apparent to me anyways. Uh, one of the things that made me believe him right off the bat was he said to me, he said, look, this thing, that this big one that I shot, was dirty blonde like a coyote. He says, I thought they were supposed to be brown or black. Well, he knew nothing about it. He doesn't read sightings. He, he didn't educate himself, you know. Uh, any, anybody who studies sightings knows that there's probably like two or 5% of sightings or 3% or whatever are actually light colored Sasquatches. You know, they come in different colors. And he was faced with an animal that was not the color he'd expected it to be. And that, that's usually a pretty good sign right there. He said the two young ones were dark, dark brown, like almost black, you know, which the, my trapper friend has only seen black ones. He said they were all black, except for the old ones get gray, the big ones, you know, they get a little bit of gray on them. Um, you know, and this, and that's been a common thread, through, you know, with so many people I've talked to in sightings, you know, they've seen a big gray one or a big grayish one, or they seen a, you know, a reddish brown one, you know, mm -hmm. but most, most of the ones up here in Alberta that people say are, are, uh, they, they describe it as darkest brown, as dark brown as it can be without being black. So, you know, I, that's why I think that, uh, you know, I, well, I'm, 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 I'm completely sure that Justin's telling the truth. Um, well, but, I've got a question for you here, but I'm going to tease it, as they say. So I'm going to ask you a question here. You think about it. Then we're going to just take a quick little break here for one of our sponsors. But the question I have for you, Ken, is from uh, a caller here that's wrote me a question. They wanted to know if they, um, they want to preserve roadkill for artistic purposes. So their question is, 
is how to preserve a kill that you find, say hiking or roadkill or something like feathers, horns, or later use. How do you, what's the best way to keep that? You think about that for a second. Uh, I'm sure you have an answer right off the bat. And uh, we'll be right back, folks. We just want to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor here. Three, two, one. Okay. And we're back. All right. So the question to you, Ken, before was we had a question here from um, a friend of ours regarding roadkill or um, dead animals found while they're hiking, how to keep them preserved for long term without spoiling. Well, it just depends on the, it depends on, on, on the condition that they found them in. Because a lot of times, you know, with roadkill or, or something that's found dead, um, in, in a lot of cases, they've already spoiled by the time that you, you found them. Now, if you're talking about, like you say, uh, something with feathers, a bird, feathers, I mean, you can, um, I mean, they, they preserve them. So they, you know, they don't need anything to preserve them. The only thing you have to be very careful about is legality. Uh, and especially in America, most birds are, are federally protected and you actually don't have the right to touch their feathers even. Uh, you know, up here in Canada, we can get a found dead permit for something that's salvageable. Uh, but usually, I mean, if you're talking about a roadkill mammal, I mean, it would have to be skinned and salted and, and preserved the, the same way a hunted specimen would be, uh, you know. Is there some kind of go kit that really, they could, they want to know if there's some kind of kit or something they could, until you can get is there some kind of kit, Ken, that they could keep in their car or uh, in their luggage? Like, are you saying uh, maybe a bucket of salt or something that like that for a fresh kill? Would that be good enough? Uh, well, I, salt wouldn't really work if it's from the outside. You still have to skin an animal in order to, to, to cure the hide from the inside. Correct. You know, about the best thing you could have uh, the best thing you could have really to, to preserve something is if you had a big cooler full of ice and then you were able to get it to, to uh, a place where you could skin it or process it properly or get it to somebody who knew how to do it. Like um, you have to be, you know, that's one of the reasons like when you go out hunting, you have all of the necessary gear with you to field dress and, you know, to get something uh, back home. You know, you have to be able to transport it. You know, if you find something that's been laying in the sun for a whole day, you know, and it's really hot, <clears throat> chances are when you try to process it, it's going to lose the, uh, the, the upper layer of epidermis, you know, unless it's really, really fresh. But um, no, there's, 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 no, there's no real magic bullet as far as, or special kit. You just have to have the knowledge to process the animal. <coughs> Excuse me. As far as collecting evidence, though, things like hair tissue samples or something that you wanted to collect for DNA purposes, is it my understanding you want to keep that in something that's a paper, like a box or an envelope or something like that? An envelope for hair. Uh, Chantal, could you get me a drink of water? <coughs> okay. Sorry, my, I'm, I need a... That's all right. Drink of water here, but... Um, um, well, I collected scat mm -hmm. from a nest. Uh, now it was frozen. I collected five bags of it, and uh, I actually had it tested by, uh, you know, my contacts in the fish and wildlife in the government here in, in Alberta, and uh, they asked me how sure it was, how sure I was that it was Sasquatch, and I told them I was a hundred percent sure. And they said, "Well, you can't be a hundred percent sure." I said, "Well, tell you what." I mean, it was a big nest. It was a big bedside. The trapper took me to it. And there had to be 30, 40 piles of, of frozen scat. Like, I think I've been living in there for months. And it was the winter time. And so, it, and it was funny because it was, you know, like, I, if, if I just saw it outside of this situation, I would have thought it was black bear. Uh, but in this area, there's really no black bears, mostly grizzly bears. And no black bear, well, they're not awake in the winter. And they would never live in a big bed of of grass and and things that was you know like this thing was living in and the trapper told me he said it it, it was a sasquatch he, you know and he says it ran afoul of one of his traps and i actually got a big bag of hair uh 
from the where it was caught in this trap, and it actually it actually destroyed a 330 conibear within 30 feet. Uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the 330 conibear. It's hardened steel. I've talked to trappers. They said it's impossible. You, you'd have to have you'd have to tie it between two trucks in order to bend the thing. And I says exactly. But this thing did that, and it lost a bunch of hair. I actually filled this bag up with hair and mailed it to John Bindernagel. John mailed it to somebody else and everybody swears they never got it. Just vanished, vanished. I got a photograph of my son holding a bag full of hair. And it was really interesting. It was almost like human hair. And nobody, you know, uh, Tyler Huggins is a good friend of mine. He, he was chasing that bag of hair forever. And there was actually skin attached to some of that hair. But the scat was tested by the government, and the government's been counting grizzly bears by dna and scats. So they had a, a lab set up that was, uh, you know, specialized in it. And it took them a year to test it because, uh, you know, they, they challenged me if it was chimpanzee, and they had Gen Bank, and they know what it was. Well, it came back inconclusive. And uh, luckily, I knew the people who tested it. And they told me, they said, uh, uh, it's actually the result you wanted. They said, you know, they're not going to sequence it um, because it's too expensive. But they said it doesn't match anything in GenBank right off the get-go. And that Richard Substat, who worked on that other project, he's passed away now. But he told me if they would have run it through for human parameters, they would have actually had hits. I don't know. I didn't know at the time anything about DNA. Uh, but the, my friend in the government made it very, very clear. And, and he was about as senior as you get in, in, in the government. He made it very clear that DNA will never be conclusive. So you have, uh, you have insight. You, know, Bill, Ken, you, have, never, you have friends that are on the inside track of this here, and you've mentioned, you know, hair samples going missing. I've heard of hair samples going missing. Um, so why do they want to keep it quiet? Yeah. What's your opinion on this? Why, why all the hush from the government regarding Sasquatch? I don't, you know, I ask my, myself this question all the time, but from what happened out of that incident, uh, it, it basically, it is what we all want. Um, now, why? I, I, I don't understand, like, um, uh, I, I did get a, a, an opinion on killing them from both federal government in Canada and the provincial government. And the, the federal government told me that if it doesn't have a scientific name, it does not legally exist. So that it exists outside the law, which means it can be killed at any time, by any reason, by any person, uh, for any reason. And, and uh, they said that if I had a dead one, they didn't even think they could take it from me. Now, the provincial guys said... No, you, you, you get away with shooting one, but you'd never shoot two and we'd take it from you. So it was two stark differences in, in the opinion from the federal to the provincial. Uh, the guys, the federal guys were really honest with me. And I, I, I mean, these are people I work with in my business. So, you know, I asked them to treat it seriously and they did. Uh, but they, they, they talked like um, they didn't think they were out there. But provincial guys talked like they knew it was out there. <laughs> so what know? do you think about the stories of people that are intimidated that have evidence that's too good? Where do you stand I, on, on the intimidation stuff? I believe it. I believe it completely. I, I wish that I had never had that scat test, to be honest, because now I'm on their radar. Um, there was also a biologist here uh, in Alberta that used to clean bones and, and uh, used to take care of of specimens for the, the government in the U of A. Um, and if you gave him enough drinks, he'd tell you there were Sasquatches. If you had a few drinks, he'd talk about it. He's, he's passed away now, unfortunately, but uh, I've talked with uh, a lot of his friends, some of them in law enforcement, some of them in, in, that worked with him in the industry, and, and uh, I've been able to piece together what he used to talk about. And he says that he's not allowed, he wasn't allowed to discuss it. But he kept saying, you know, there's things in the woods that would blow your mind. You wouldn't believe it. And uh, then I talked to somebody else who worked with him through uh, game farming because uh, he was working in that area. And 
the, that guy said no. He said the word Sasquatch. He said Sasquatch right up front. So, um, so I have anec anecdotal mm -hmm. evidence that they know. Um, personally, uh, I would like to see them have a scientific name, uh, you know, but I don't think that I really don't think that they should classify them as as an animal. I think that they should classify them. They should make up a, a complete new classification for them. And if there was one thing that I could ever ask for from from uh, you know from official people, and that is that the animal be totally totally and completely off limits to any special interest groups, any of them. The nobody can use the the Sasquatch for a fundraiser to save the Sasquatch. Uh, as soon as you have people trying to shut down logging because of Sasquatches, you make it profitable for a multi-billion dollar industry to kill them, okay? As soon as you try to shut it down, you know, as soon as you try to push your human agenda with these, these creatures, you make it profitable for the other side to actually annihilate them. So I would like to see a law once they're, when they're discovered that says that no special interest group has any right or title over, over the, the Sasquatch for fundraising or for anything else, it, it's totally off limits legally i think that that would be very very important to me you know does it bother you at all ken that uh, they haven't been discovered i mean here you've been close and personal with this for over 40 years um had the opportunity to possibly have that skull brought into your shop in the last 20 or 30 years and uh, you know the amount of evidence that you've seen is still elusive to the point where it's just you know the smoke billows in front of us instead of what everybody wants, uh, you know, which is this hard evidence. Does it bother you at all when you uh, kind of do a gut check, the fact that this evidence is just so elusive? Is there something, do you ever toy with the fact that there may be something else going on? I've always, I, I, that's, I've thought about that many times, uh, you know, whether there was something else at play. Now I have, you know, in my investigations, you know, there's people that post documents on the internet and, and some of them disappear real quickly. And uh, one of one of the things that I read somewhere was how they had a contingency plan for discovery. They are you know, basically keeping, uh, you know, keeping tabs and keeping a certain amount of information that they will release if it's ever discovered to show that they in this particular thing that I, I read was that uh, the animals or the creatures uh, ability to hide and to elude humans has been the best help in them keeping it covered up mm -hmm. you know you know and and it, it, it makes total sense because obviously the creature is uh, I think it's more plentiful than people think but i don't think there's as many as there used to be mm -hmm. um and uh you know for, from somebody who's hunted you know i've hunted grizzly bears and i've hunted you know boone and crockett sized white tails i mean i can be in the vicinity of that white vicinity of that white tail for for five years and only see him once in five years and yet he lives in the bush behind my house you know he can elude me and there's there's millions of white tails well, imagine something that's, that's 100 times smarter than a whitetail, and there's only a handful of them. Right. Theoretically, from, from the viewpoint of a hunter, you're not going to find it. You're not going to get one, you know. Um, it makes total sense that this animal is that elusive if it's not just an animal. It's a, an actual hominid. It, well, it has to be. It has to be. There, there's no other... There's no other way an animal of that or a creature of that size can can hide unless it is uh, it has intelligence that, mm -hmm. and, and abilities that's off the charts. You know. Um, what if these other cryptids? Um, I have a guest coming up uh, in a couple weeks, Alex Evans, who's an artist and a uh, ex uh, BFRO investigator, but she. Um, mm -hmm. She's going to Australia or Tasmania, I think, to check out the thylacine, uh, and whether or not the thylacine still exists. I know there's a thylacine society down there, and she made a, a mock-up of a thylacine and mailed it off to the crypto society down there. What are these other cryptids out there, the likelihood that something like that uh, still exists? Well, uh, um, the thylacine's interesting 
um, I, I've actually I've, I've been to Australia, and uh, y you know they they have protection on all the animals there, uh, all the native animals. You know they have all the feral animals, and the farmers hate it, so they kill everything they see. They just do. I, I hate to say it, but they do. And uh, if you want to discover uh, if they have bottles of whiskey and sit down with some of these farmers that live in the area and they'll tell you whether or not they've shot one. <laughs> it's not a nice thing to say, but um, I think it's possible because I've, I've talked to people from that area and, and, uh, and they said that, yeah, they know they're there, but they just don't want a whole bunch of people stomping around. Now, I tended to believe what they had to say about that. You know, that's m from my own experience. But I should also tell you that when I was in Australia, I talked to a couple of people who've actually seen yowies. And uh, that was really interesting because they described a Sasquatch, um, you know, from the slouch shoulders to the, you know, and, uh, and I mean, I, they were no different than any other Sasquatch witness in, in, from the hunting community that I've talked to. Um, so I found that quite interesting. I have no doubt that uh, there is Sasquatch-like creatures or related creatures in uh, Asia, in China. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing work in China and I spoke to them about the Yaren and my translator told me that she was brought up on stories of the Yaren living in the woods. Um, and she showed me on the maps where they are supposed to live. And I believe it was Jeff Meldrum who went and took a, looked at a cast of a, of a footprint there mm -hmm. and said they were indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the Sasquatch. So, you know, I have no, I have no doubts that, that they're probably in, in Russia and Indonesia and the places where they say they are, you know, the Yetis in uh, the Himalayas. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I mean, it, it wouldn't surprise me. I, I, I think so. It's just, it's basically the same thing. But how, how amazing that something can be that elusive. Isn't that amazing? Oh, it's totally amazing. What about yeah. uh, prehistoric animals and uh, you know, in general, you hear about Thunderbirds still, you still hear about stories in uh, South America and Africa, um, you know, Loch Ness Monster, all these other crypto animals there. Do you think there's a problem with the, you know, the Darwinistic timeline right now, the evolutionary tale? Where do you stand on, on that? I think that... Um, uh, I think that there's some some interesting animals in the ocean that we don't know about yet. Um, I, I don't know if you heard the story about the shark that was swallowed. Did you hear about that? No. Uh, yeah, well, it's, you can look it up. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, off the coast of New Zealand, um, they had a 10 foot plus great white shark, a female that had a, one of those tags that, that records data. And uh, they found it washed up on the shore because it's designed to float away if something happens to the shark. And uh, when they analyzed the, the data, they says that uh, the shark was swimming at the level that they do. And all of a sudden, it went straight down to one of the trenches, like right down to the trench. And the, the, uh, uh, the uh, temperature went up to 75 degrees. And they said, then it came all the way back up again. Then it went all the way back down again. And they knew they could tell from the temperature it was inside a bigger animal. Wow. And it's you go right on YouTube and watch this. And, and uh, they said that they have no idea what A can dive that deep and B, what could swallow a, a 10 foot plus great white shark. Wow. But it swallowed it. And, it, uh, you know, uh, um, and, and just talking to some of the people, like I spent time in New Zealand too. And I mean, everybody in New Zealand seen a UFO. There's so many of them down there, apparently. I mean, I got some crazy stories from people there about that stuff. But, um, you know, I, I, I tend to listen. I just want to listen. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to point a finger and, and say anything. I just, you know, I'm – ever since this whole Sasquatch thing came up, I, I've, I realize the older you get, the, the more you realize you don't know. So I try not to be judgmental. I listen to people, and I process the information for myself, you know. Um, obviously I don't believe everything I heard. I, I'm not, you know, I, I know this, 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 people talk about mermaids. No, I ain't buying that. Um, just not buying it. Um, but, you know, seeing a, a serpent-like creature come out of the, 
the depth of the ocean and go back down. That's right. totally plausible to me. And yeah. as a taxidermist, you probably have an appreciation for the the Ripley's Believe It or Not merman, mermaid uh, that was going around through the freak shows back in the turn of the century. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's a little piece of trivia. I actually saw the Iceman when I was a kid. Oh, you did? Oh, wow. When they brought it up to Canada, um, you know, the whole story about how it got seized at the border and Walter right, Mondale right. got it. I, I, it came up to the uh, Edmonton exhibition, the Klondike Days exhibition. And I was a kid and I went, I paid my dollar or whatever. And I went in there and I looked at this thing in the ice. So I stood, I stood in front of it and it was the, you know, the original one. I was right. just a kid. So that's burned into your memory. Now, you know, I only have pictures to look out, but there was a real sense of legitimacy when I looked into, you know, the, the crusty old black and white photographs. What do you think of the, the Minnesota Iceman? Well, they said it was shot through the eye which makes total sense because some of these hunters are unbelievable shots. And when a Sasquatch peeks around the tree, that's what you see. Oh. And shot right in the eye. I mean, it makes total sense to me, you know, puts its head around the tree and gets, gets a 30 odd six in the eyeball. That's it. It's over. You got yourself a specimen. Well, I don't think I've ever met anybody who's seen that before. You'd be the first or they've never well, brought it up. I, I, I remember it from, from a kid, you know, because I was so, intensely interested in that stuff of course i wanted it all to be true and then i grew up and then i became uh, you know my belief system became you know solidified and uh, and i should also mention that even when i realized that you know when these hunters started coming to me with the stories uh, and the accounts of sasquatches it still took me a, probably a couple of weeks to allow myself to believe it um you know, the, the whole belief system is, is uh, it's, it, it, I tell you what, I learned a lot about it. You know, uh, I always said that if, you know, the police came to my door and says, where were you last night at 10 o'clock? And, and, you know, because somebody down the road turned up dead, I would say, oh, and I was here. I never did it. You know, man, I'll tell you what, like, I don't know when those guys come to my door, whether they believe I did it or not. I probably want a lawyer. You know, I didn't do it, but. Um, you know, and I mean, you look at people's belief systems. I mean, there's people that actually believe they're going to get like 45 virgins up in heaven. So they blow themselves into pieces this big in a marketplace. They actually believe it. Like they believe it enough to blow themselves up. Like, you know, I, it's not a nice analogy, but it, it drives home the point that when you have somebody in front of you, that's not going to believe you about the Sasquatch, the evidence, they're not going to look at the evidence. They're not going to do nothing. They're not going to believe it. They're just not going to believe it. So I've had a, a few issues dealing with people like that. Uh, usually what I tell them is I says, look, you know, you, you have to, if you're open-minded and you think that these things can be out there, um, you know, you have to look into it yourself. But I says, there's 500 reported sightings a year, you know, so people are seeing something. And, uh, you know, that's, that's probably the biggest stumbling block that I run into with these investigations. And, and when I have people come up and say, you're gonna to have to prove it to me, mm -hmm. I have to explain to them that I'm, I'm five or six or seven years past that. You know, you're, I'm not going back that far. I'm already past that. I'm just gathering information mm -hmm. for myself. And I'm waiting for that one day that somebody comes in and sets something down on my, uh, you know, on my bench or drives in with something in the back of their truck. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you one thing right now, if anybody ever brings me something like that, it ain't going to be, it's going to be right at the news station. <laughs> well, before, I, before I let you go, Ken, because our time's running down here and I don't want to keep you. Um, your documentary, Big Fur's uh, been under works for quite a while. Um, I know that the GoFundMe has surpassed the amount that they were trying to, to raise, but people can still donate. I think you can just go to type in GoFundMe or type in Big Fur GoFundMe. It'll come right up. Where do, where do we stand with the documentary or have I missed a beat here and, and not found a link to it? No, no, it's um, actually I talked to Dan today. It's not my movie. It's just about me. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he, the thing's been in post-production for quite a while. There's the, the, he hired some people to do animation. We actually went into a studio and recorded three songs. 
I just got the master versions of those songs this weekend, uh, two Roy Orbison songs. Uh, I used to be a Roy Orbison impersonator back in the day. And I'm also a musician and songwriter. So I wrote the actual theme song for uh, the Big Fur movie. And it's, it's actually pretty good. Uh, I got the mastered version. I'm pretty excited about it. So the, the movie's going to be funny and entertaining. Uh, I haven't seen it. Uh, there's also some personal stuff in there that I'm not looking forward to seeing. But um, it's a documentary. And my, my, my message is... Uh, Kids, any all you kids out there, if, if they make a documentary about you, don't do anything stupid because it'll be in the film. <laughs> but, um, so can yeah. we look for that in so 2019? I, it's, it, yeah, it's it's pretty much done. It's it's uh, now they're like they're just doing some very last minute tweaking on it, mm -hmm. and then it has to they have to figure out how they're going to distribute it. At you know, it's all in Dan Wayne's hands. It's not my movie. Um, it's just about me. So, well, yeah, if, you haven't, but it, it, if you haven't seen it, you can I'm, find you can find trailers of it. Yeah, or trailers a, on YouTube. There's a new trailer coming out. Okay. Um, because uh, uh, Dan does the, the the original trailer actually captures the movie very well. It's apparently it's funny and it's entertaining, and they want to make a, a a trailer that's a little more true to how the movie turned out. So, you know, these are just things they've told me and, uh, you know, I'm not holding my breath, but it, 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 so, and it's been test screened and all that stuff. So. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on here, Ken. It's oh, been course. great talking to you and, um, I would love to have you back in the future. So, um, I'll shoot you an email down the road and, uh, maybe we can finally, uh, Put our Sasquatches side by side, and uh, be nice to have brother meet sister and uh, oh, hang yeah, out for a bit. <laughs> yeah, I really liked your model. I, I really liked it. I, it. It popped up quite a few times on my uh, Facebook feed, and I, and I, it, it looks good. It's great. I well, like it. and it, that means a yeah, lot coming from the world champion here. Um, you know, I rushed mine. I had to rush it for the movie. I, I I'm probably going to redo a bunch of stuff on it, but. It's just that I can't make any money off of it, you know, when I have to pay my bills. It's just one of those things. Well, right? yeah, are you in, in, looking to David Bacara at the uh, the Sasquatch Museum down there? And uh, I think he's got one in Florida. He wants a skunk ape. And uh, mm -hmm. that's definitely a, a guy that's serious about buying Sasquatches. So um, I don't know okay. if he's reached out to you or not. But, um, yeah, no, that, that guy's serious about getting good material in his museum and i think even cliff berkman's opening a museum here on the columbia river gorge so there's another person i don't know if yeah. anybody even knows that your bigfoot's for sale i would i would assume that most people think that uh, maybe he's not or she's not well i think that because the movie's not out and i built it in the movie that i right. might use it for some promo oh and gotcha so if, if that's the case then fine i'll have it but i kept all my molds like i all of my uh I made I made uh, molds of all my pieces so I can make more, you know, a lot quicker now. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Ken. Appreciate talking to you, and uh, you have a good night, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I, it was fun. Take care. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. That was Ken Walker. Thank you again. At the time I recorded this, uh, Ken Walker was somewhere in Germany entering a contest it looks like so maybe by the time this one comes out he'll be four-time world champion i assumed it looked like a a conference or a competition of sorts so good luck to ken and i look forward to talking to him again in the future uh, i'd love to actually get up there and look at his studio sometime but go on the website and check out his stuff it's an amazing accomplishment and um Hopefully that documentary comes out again real soon. Okay, well, I am headed up to the Oregon Paranormal Summit in Quinault, Washington. If you haven't been up that way, it's a pretty big conference of sorts. So I'm going to get all sorts of interviews while I'm up at the Paranormal Summit in Ocean Shores. It's near 
the infamous Grays Harbor, Washington. So that should be a lot of fun. Have some other things in the works, too. So I may put out more than one episode uh, coming up just based upon how much traffic is coming in on my hard drive. Again, you're listening to Strange Brow Radio. It's your chance to go on and check out strangebrow.com. There's tickets on sale for our Secrets of the Sasquatch Summit. There's also tickets on sale to check out William Becker, his psychic class. Uh, all these things are available for you right now. And we haven't released the eSETI tickets yet, but if you haven't seen a spaceship and you want to see a spaceship, come come with us. Come with us to eSETI Ranch. That'll be Labor Day weekend 2019. What else do you got to do? Okay. We'll be back again real soon, like every Monday, as promised. This is Strange Bow Radio, and on a count of three, one, two, three, we'll see you in the trees.